So thank you so much, Principal Francisco, and thank you so much to the community here at Prince William uh, Schools and specifically here at Old Bridge Elementary. It's a delight to be here tonight. I'm Amy Guderra, Secretary of Education for the Commonwealth of Virginia, and I'm joined by my friend and colleague and fellow secretary, Janet Kelly, who's our Secretary of Health for the Commonwealth. Um, before we start uh, with the stars of the show, who will be joining us in a couple of minutes, Secretary Kelly and I wanted to spend a few minutes just providing some context about why this conversation matters so much at this very moment, and just remind some people, about all of us, about some things that happened in the last several weeks and months about brought, that brought us together. Um, but before we do that, I also want to do a warm welcome, not just to those of us here in Old Bridge Elementary in Prince William, but I want to welcome everybody who's joining us across the Commonwealth, whether you're in, in Virginia Beach, in Loudoun, in Washington County Schools. Uh, we're gathering across the Commonwealth today to talk about how we can take common sense solutions to restore childhood and to institute common sense solutions about restoring childhood and making sure that we are reversing the damage done to our children because of overuse of cell phones and social media. So this is a conversation that we've started over several months. Uh, and this week we had some really big news. Um, as you might recall, the governor released an executive order back in July uh, calling for cell-free education. Uh, he, at that point, directed the Department of Education to issue guidance that would then be used by school boards and school divisions across the Commonwealth to develop their own policies and put those in place uh, to create bell-to-bell -bell cell phone policies. Those needs need to be instituted by January 1st of 2025. But a critical part of that process of developing that guidance has been listening to Virginians. Things are always better when we listen to each other and we learn from each other, and that's why we're all gathered today, is to continue those conversations. I want to thank Superintendent Coons, our state uh, superintendent of public instruction, for leading an incredible three months of making sure that all Virginians had a chance to review the draft guidance, to think about this, to raise concerns, have questions answered, and to give their suggestions about what they want their schools to look like and what they think makes sense in terms of putting controls around cell phones and social media. So thank you, Superintendent Coons, for making sure that we made sure Virginians were heard. And they were heard. We had 6,000 public comments written, and we had over eight sessions in every region of the Commonwealth, as well as 21 stakeholder sessions. So thank you to people for coming up and continuing to show up and have these conversations. So I want to take a moment and dive into one of the comments that we heard uh, that I think is important for us to dive into this evening, but also is important for you all and, all and across our Commonwealth to make sure we're having conversations when we're talking with our school boards, when we're talking with our neighbors. And that's about keeping our children safe and secure in our schools. We know that this is the main priority of schools and of parents, is to make sure that our children are kept safe and secure. We heard this through the comments that came back after the executive order came out, and I hope that everyone can see when they look at the guidance, which is now uh, available on the Department of Education's website, that we added a lot of language and a lot of detail about what we're currently doing in Virginia to make sure that our, our communities and our schools are safe. Um, Virginia is well regarded across the country for being a leader in campus and in school safety. But we're not going to rest on our laurels. It's too important. And so what we need to do is to make sure that we are constantly thinking about best practices and how do we make sure that we are always having open communication? Because that's the other piece of this. We know after the shooting in Georgia, which was horrific, many parents got in touch with us through the comment period and said, how do I make sure that there is open communication with my school and my child and I know that they're OK if there's an emergency? And we we know that communication matters all the time between schools and parents, and especially that's true in an emergency. So I hope when you see the guidance, you'll see that not only have we put in there all of the existing um, requirements that schools have to make sure that they're communicating with parents, making sure that they are doing everything possible to keep um, uh, students and schools secure, but the governor also has called on the Secretary of Public Safety, myself, the superintendent, to put, come together and have a task force over the next several months that will double down on making sure that we provide guidance and tools and resources to inform our school divisions about how they best can ensure that we have high quality, constant, consistent, and clear communication between parents and schools at all times, and especially in times where there's a special worry. Um, we know that when parents and schools are talking to each other and communicating, we know that our children thrive, and that's what we all want. We want our children to have childhoods that are safe, secure, secure, 
vibrant and healthy and full of joy. And that's why we're so, so pleased that you're here tonight because that's the conversation we want to have. How do we restore childhood? How do we make sure that happens? And so now I'd like to turn this microphone over to my friend who's going to provide more detail about where our children are today and why this conversation and you being here tonight matters so much. Janet. Well, thank you so much, Secretary Gadara. And I hope if you're a student or a teacher or an admin in Virginia's public schools, you feel a little better after um, hearing from Secretary Gadara. She is a fearless leader um, on behalf of each of you. And um, we have lots of conversations in the office about how we can make things even better in Virginia. So you're lucky to have her in this role. I'm Secretary Kelly. So if Secretary Gadara is worried about your kids during school. I'm concerned about them after school. Um, so you can think of it in that way and more of the mental health aspects. Um, how many of you were on Facebook when Facebook originally started? Raise your hands. Do you remember? It was kind of neat, right? We could connect with our friends from college. We saw our nieces and nephews cheerleading tryouts, soccer games. It was actually, I have this, this relative nostalgia about those times. But something shifted in the early 2010s. We knew before that, that we were trading things off. We kind of had this sense of like, this is free? How are they making money? Oh, they're taking my data. They're finding out where I went to high school and college and what music I like. But okay, the trade-off's worth it. But something shifted in the early 2010s. It shifted um, almost every aspect of our lives. The way that we eat, the way that we drink, the way that we fall asleep, and almost everything that we do. And when you're Secretary of Health and you hear stats like the ones I'm about to read you, you start paying attention outside of your own experience as a mom at home. And so that's what we've started doing. And it's, this has been a very long conversation culminating in tonight. It didn't take long to see this impact on kids. So I'm gonna read these stats. Before I do, I wanna tell you, you may hear some things tonight as a parent that makes you feel uncomfortable. That's okay. We gotta have hard conversations. Um, but we don't wanna say anything that makes you think that, or feel, feel shame or blame. That's what, not, not what this is about. When you know better, you do better. At least that's my mantra as a mom. Um, so here are some, some of the stats that have concerned us. 57% of teen girls report feeling consistently hopeless. Suicide is the leading cause of death for 10 to 14 year olds. ER visits among adolescent girls have doubled in recent years. I could go on for another 10 minutes, but I know you wanna hear from Professor Height. These are the ones that worry me the most. There's nothing wrong with good products coming to the market and companies making a good profit off of those products. We call that entrepreneurialism. Where I get concerned is when I see companies put extremely harmful products like addictive algorithms into the market at extremely high profits. And that's when it can cross a line into exploitation. And when that happens, it's the government's job to raise the alarm, to sound the alarm, to raise a flag and say, this isn't okay. And that's part of why we're here tonight. That's why this conversation is so important. That's why Secretary Gadara and her team are working night and day to help kids learn during the day and protect them so they're not spending 33 hours of their week on social media watching other people live their lives instead of living out their purpose and potential. So without further ado, we would like to welcome Dr. Jonathan Haidt and First Lady Suzanne Youngkin to the stage. Jonathan is a enormously uh, sought after speaker. We are so fortunate to have him in Virginia. You all know he wrote the book, The Anxious Generation, which is a bestseller. Um, and Mrs. Yunkin is, there is no tireless, no more tireless advocate in Virginia than Mrs. Yunkin when it comes to kids. Um, we are soul sisters uh, in this movement to find some common sense and bring it back to the Commonwealth and even across the country when it comes to cell phones and social media. And we look so forward to hearing what you have to say tonight. So without further ado. Welcome to everyone at Old Bridge Elementary. Welcome to everyone on the live stream. We could not be more excited to be welcoming Professor Jonathan Haidt here back to the Commonwealth of Virginia. Welcome. Well, thank you. 
Oh, thanks so much, Suzanne. Uh, what she's referring to is that I was a professor at the University of Virginia for, for 17 years. It's where I started my career. It's, it's where I met my wife. It's where I started my family. Um, it's by far the most beautiful place I've ever lived. Just driving around central Virginia any season of the year, the rolling farmlands, the, the Blue Ridge Mountains, Shenandoah Valley, I just, I, I really, I love the state. Um, I'm also really glad to be back because Virginia is, Virginia is leading the country on how to do this. Uh, so the executive order, I just, I just read the final guidance this morning. It's really, it's really well done in that whatever team wrote it, and I, I suppose in Secretary Gadara's office, um, they really understood the research. They understood why, that the research on why it has to be from bell to bell. If you're going phone free, you can't just do it in class, which is what most schools in the country are doing. They're banning the phones in class, which means that everyone's on their phone between classes. So uh, it really did things right. And then the other thing that I'm so excited by is the, the, a lot of the book, the, the last quarter of the book, is about collective action, how we, 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 have to, we can only get out of this if we work together. Each family acting alone, it's really hard. But when we act together, we can solve this. And schools are the best place to solve it. And this model, where we're having a conversation, and it's not being put out on the internet for anyone to watch at home, no. You have to actually go to your school, go to your kid's school, and you've got the parents, the teachers there, so that after we're done with our conversation, and we'll be doing the same thing here, you, people can talk about what they're gonna do in their school, and that's the way we solve this. That's the way we roll back the phone-based childhood and restore the play-based childhood. So I'm thrilled to be here, let's talk. All right, so excited. Again, we're gonna be talking about, he asked me to call him John, so I am gonna do what I am told. We're gonna to be talking to John about the anxious generation, how the great rewiring of childhood is causing an epidemic of mental illness. Um, in the essence of time, we have put together uh, some questions for you. I'm gonna be asking those. These questions have been informed by curious and smart educators as well as concerned parents. So I feel obligated to read them verbatim so that we make sure we get these questions out here. So although you've researched and written extensively on a variety of topics related to brain, screen, society, and more, tell us what prompted you to pin this specific New York Times bestseller, The Anxious Generation, and can you please expand on the generation that the book is focused on? Sure. So um, I got a book contract three or four years ago to write a book on what social media is doing to democracy, how it's changing our democratic discourse and making it much harder. The Founding Fathers' vision of how democracy works is kind of threatened by this new environment. And I was going to just have the first chapter be, what did social media do to kids? Because I had some research on that. I was doing a lot of research on that for my previous book, The Coddling of the American Mind. So I was going to just write one chapter on that and then move on to what it's doing to democracy. To democracy. But once I'd made the graphs, uh, working with, with Zach Rausch, my, my lead researcher here, once we'd made the graphs- in the audience, thank uh, you very much. And we saw all the, you know, I can show you every graph in the book. Things are going along, there's no change from the 90s until 2010, 2011, and all of a sudden, someone flips a light switch and all the bad stuff rises, especially anxiety and depression, and especially for girls. So once I saw graph after graph, something big happened in the early 2010s, and especially once we tracked it down around the world and we saw it wasn't just us, it was all over the Western world. Around 2012, it's like someone flipped a light switch and girls especially all over the English speaking world and beyond started checking into psychiatric emergency wards. So what was it? I couldn't just say, well, you know, now I'm gonna put that aside and go talk about, like, no, we have to figure this out. What happened? And so that's what launched me on this. I decided ultimately I have to write a whole book on it. Um, so that's, that's where we are. Oh, and then you asked about the generation. So um, what we saw on college campuses in 2015 was that the students coming in suddenly, 2014, 2015, were very, very anxious. All of our mental health centers got filled all around the state, all around the country. Um, and we thought at the time that those were millennials. That's what we call young people. But it turns out the millennial generation didn't go to 1999, birth year as we thought. It actually stops in 1995. And if you're born in 1996, you had a different, you went through puberty on a smartphone with social media. Whereas if you were born in the early 90s, you didn't get that until high school or even college. So Gen Z is birth year 1996 and beyond. And they are very different from the millennials because they have much worse mental health. And I believe, and I try to show in the book, 
It's because you can't go through puberty in a smartphone and social media. You have to be talking, playing, arguing, fighting, falling in love, flirting, all that stuff. And most of that gets taken out when kids are doing this five to 10 hours a day. Expand a little bit on the difference in boys and girls. We heard Secretary Kelly reference some of the statistics. You do a very deep dive in the book about some of the things you're seeing. Share uh, with everyone that's joining us tonight a little bit about that. Sure. So originally I thought the focus of the book was going to be on what social media is doing to girls. That's where the evidence is clearest. The correlations are consistent. When we do experiments, we find, we find that too. The girls are usually more affected by this. And so I have a whole chapter on why is social media so toxic for girls? And there's a lot of reasons. Everybody knows the social comparison that you know, everybody, all teenagers are insecure. They're all comparing themselves. But for girls, it's just much harder because so much of it is about their looks, their body, their hair, their face. So uh, uh, girls are just judged much more harshly. They're, they're much more harmed by growing up constantly being commented on. Um, then there's the perfectionism, uh, which, this in, which Instagram in particular encourages, which affect, affects girls. Um, then there's the relational aggression, which the girls do. So for, which, the boys are doing more physical aggression. Girls harm each other's reputations and relationships. And social media makes it easy to do that 24 hours a day, even on weekends, you can do that. So for a lot of reasons, like you take for older people here, remember middle school, wasn't that like the worst part of life? <laughs> well, imagine being a girl, and now you take all the bad parts of being a girl in middle school and you multiply them by five. So girls really got hit hard by the move, especially onto Instagram, I believe. Okay, so I thought that was what was clear, and I thought for boys, you know, it's not so clear, and their depression rates aren't as high, so what? But, we, but, but Zach and I figured out what's going on. Boys, it's a little different. If we check in on the kids at the age of 14, it's really clear that the girls are doing worse. The boys are lonely. The rates of depression are, high, are much higher than they were. But the boys are mostly playing video games, these amazing video games, these incredibly immersive, beautiful, exciting video games, which they enjoy. And they're watching incredibly immersive pornography, which they enjoy. So when we check in on them at 14, the girls seem to be doing worse. But now go on, the oldest are now 28. How are they doing at 28? Well, the girls are still much more anxious, but they finished high school and they finished college and they got jobs. The girls are actually more functional. Only 40, college, uh, college graduates are only 40% male. Girls are doing much better than boys all across the country, all across the Western world. So the boys are more likely to be unemployed, to, have a, uh, to be living at home with their parents. So in the long run, this phone-based childhood, in, in a sense, it might even block boys' development more severely than it blocks girls' development. But we didn't notice that, because the girls' case is just so much more florid and obvious. Um, so for boys, boys have to be out getting experiences in the real world, taking risks, sometimes getting physically hurt even, um, if they're completely protected from that. Um, then they don't have the toughening experience, they don't turn into men. The most surprising graph in the whole book, a lot of people comment on this, is the decline in broken bones. Teenage boys used to get the most broken bones. They would, the, who go, you know, who comes, older people, who comes in with a cast on their arm? It's usually a boy who was, you know, they were doing jump ramps on their bicycle and they broke their arm. Not anymore. Now, uh, since so in 2010, the numbers start dropping, by 2019, teenage boys are slightly less likely to go to the hospital than their fathers or grandfathers. They're, they're taking fewer physical risks than 50 or 70 year old men. So something has really changed for boys that is blocking their development. I wanna uh, pick at that the littlest bit because I read the book, loved it. Two things that I think the audience might um, enjoy that play on that. One is you point to the addition of the phone. I mean, I'm sorry, the camera the camera and what that did to change uh, a phone-based childhood for girls. And secondly, back to your point about the rambunctiousness of boys, you used the example of kittens. So maybe you could explain a little bit about what people should be thinking about with those two, right. two things. Okay, so, so the, what the book is really about, it's not just about phones and social media. It's really about the great rewiring of childhood. What is childhood? It's not just a period where your body grows and then you become an adult. Childhood for mammals is about play. All mammal babies play and they take risks and they run and jump 
and they go explore and they move away from their mother where they could get eaten. But you have to take risks to become a self supervising, to become an independent adult. You have to take risks and, and, and try out independence. So that's the way it always was. But beginning in the 1990s, we Americans begin to freak out. We stop trusting our neighbors. We're afraid that if you let your kid go to the next aisle in the supermarket, they'll get kidnapped, we thought. That never, ever happened. But, well, all right. There was one sort of case that was a little bit like that, and that was at one case. And the whole country freaks out. We start locking our kids up, um, uh, not giving them independence. So we take away the play-based childhood kind of gradually between 1990 and 2010. It's shrinking the degree to which kids had independence outside. Okay, that's part one. But then this incredible series of technological changes happens in a very, very short time. <clears throat> the early internet was amazing. Millennials loved it. They came out very healthy. Uh, the, early, the iPhone was amazing. It was a, just a digital Swiss Army knife. It wasn't dangerous at all. But then in a short period of time, you get push notifications. The app store, and now the phone is pinging you a lot. Um, in 2010, you get the first front-facing camera. Before then, you use your camera to take a picture of someone else. After 2010, now the girls especially are taking constant selfies. Now you get um, Instagram is invented then, and Facebook buys it in 2012. And that's why 2012 is the year that the girls move their social life onto Instagram. And I can't prove this, but I suspect that that's why we see such sharp curves for the girls. The boys are a little more slow. But the girls, it's like everything's fine, and then boom, 2012, 2013, it, it's off to the moon. Um, you get high-speed internet. Um, the point is, in 2010, teens had flip phones, and you couldn't spend 10 hours a day on a flip phone, like typing in the, you know, the alphabet on the keypad. <laughs> but by 2015, everyone's got a smartphone, high-speed internet, front-facing camera, Instagram, and now it's hard not to spend five or 10 hours a day because everyone else is on, and if you don't spend five or 10 hours a day, you're left out, and no one's going out to play anymore. Thank you so much. All right, the way I've structured the balance of the rest of the questions is with the good news. Okay, yes. Because you offer a lot of encouragement in this book. And so I don't want us to come away uh, despondent. And what you do at the very end of the book is you talk about bringing childhood back to earth. And specifically, you lay out four very practical things that any family or community could consider as options to turn the ship around from where we're sailing. Here are the four, and then I'm gonna ask you specific questions for them. No smartphones before high school. No social media before 16. Phone-free schools and more unsupervised play. So here's one I want to ask you specifically. Let's start with the first one, no smartphones. Let's start with your description, what you mean by a smartphone. Mm -hmm. And more specifically, uh, what does that have to do with a phone-based childhood? So the, the key change, what really, what really takes children out of the world that we know, the three-dimensional world with rocks and trees and nature in it, um, is not the internet itself. The millennials had the internet in the 90s and they came out fine. It's having the internet in your pocket so that you can use it all the time, even when you're on the school bus, even between classes, even at lunch in school, even when you're going to bed at night. All the time you can be online. And now 50% of American teenagers say that they are online almost constantly, almost constantly. So even when you think they're talking to you, they're actually thinking about the drama on their phone. As soon as they can, they're going to check it again. So from the moment they open their eyes, and my NYU students tell me this, I teach an undergraduate class, what's the first thing you do when you open your eyes? For almost all of them, they reach for the phone, they start with the messages. What's the last thing you do when you're going to sleep? For almost all of them, it's this, and then they, then they, cl they close their eyes. And what do they do in between? Mostly this. So, um, um, so that's the, you know, the, the, the phone-based childhood. Now, and that's what I mean by growing up like not, not on Earth. Um, so. Uh, that's, so when we, so the, the key is having the internet with you. Uh, many of us grew up with television. It was said we watched too much television. But first of all, there was a common rule. You don't have, your parents do not let you have a TV in your bedroom. That's insane. You would never want a kid to have a TV in their bedroom. But all of a sudden, kids have not just a TV in their bedroom, they've got a portal by which strange men can talk to them at night. And they've got video games. They've got everything while they're trying to go to bed. Oh, and can you imagine older people, if you could have brought your television into class and watched TV during class? That'd be completely insane. 
But that's what they do. That's what kids, if you have a smartphone, you've got everything right there in your pocket. And it's always going to be more interesting than the teacher. So, um, so that's really the transition point. When, when, when teenagers had flip phones, they still had a recognizably human childhood. But by 2015, they don't. OK, so smartphone is specifically where you have access to the internet. That's right. All right. You explain four foundational harms of phone-based childhood. They include social deprivation, sleep deprivation, attention fragmentation, and addiction. Can you tell us briefly a little bit about these? So if it was just watching TV for five or 10 hours a day, you'd say, well, that's bad for a variety of reasons. It pushes out exercise. It pushes out lots of stuff. And so what does, if they're spending five hours a day on social media is the latest stat, about eight to 10 hours a day on their, on their phones and other screens is the, is the latest stat, what gives? Where do they get the time? And the answer is time with friends plummets. If you remember older people, you remember what it was like to be hanging out with your friends and playing uh, or on your own or having an adventure. Imagine taking 80% of that out for, of your childhood because everyone's on their phones. So social deprivation is you don't, you don't spend much time with other humans. You don't spend as much time with your parents. Um, sleep deprivation is obviously what it sounds like, especially, because, especially if you let your kids have a, a, any sort of internet device in their bedrooms. They're going to be, it, th these things have such a grip that they're going to be in front of their face in the bedroom. Um, uh, attention fragmentation, this is especially about TikTok, but it's all of them, really. Um, young people, we're seeing this all over, college professors were seeing this. It's just harder, our students have a lot more trouble focusing, doing their homework. There are so many distractions, and they didn't, uh, in, in your teen years, you develop what's called executive function, where your brain learns to make a plan and then do what's necessary to achieve the plan and stick with it. But a lot of our students are getting three, four, five hundred notifications a day. They're getting pinged. They're getting interrupted every few minutes. They don't know what it is to focus for 10, 15 minutes. And this is happening even in classes, because if you have it in your pocket, you're going to check. My kids say, uh, my kids go to New York City Public Schools. You just put it in a book. You put it in your desk. Uh, other teachers have told me, boy, kids sure go to the bathroom a lot more nowadays than they used to. Um, <laughs> So attention fragmentation, and then the last is addiction. And this isn't just about social media. This is all of these apps are competing with each other to keep your kids' attention. And what that means is they, you want to you you get them to do a behavior and then get a reward on a variable ratio schedule. That's the way you addict someone. That's the way you, you get rapid levels of behavior, whether you're training a rat or a dog or a child. And so you don't want your kid exposed to a company that's going to do stimulus response, stimulus response, reward, 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 quick dopamine hit, brain rewires because there's too much dopamine. You're now less responsive to dopamine. And so a kid who is playing these incredible video games and this incredible pornography for hours every day, when they're not doing that, their brain says, this is so boring. I can't stand this, whatever it is. I need stimulation. So. Uh, that's, those are the four major harms that affect everyone. But then there's like dozens of other gender-specific harms. Uh, one of my favorite sort of topics that you talk about in the book, and I think it's really relevant as a subtext to what you just mentioned, is this notion of slow growth childhood. Can you expand on that? And more importantly, from a developmental standpoint, a coping standpoint with life, can you tell us a little bit why that is so critically important? Sure. So, you know, the book isn't just, again, it's not just about social media and phones. It's really about childhood. And humans have this bizarre childhood. Every other animal, every other mammal, including all the primates, they're born small, and then they grow and grow and grow, and then they reproduce. But humans have this interesting, I learned this long ago in graduate school, that we grow fast for the first couple of years, then we slow down for a number of years. We slow down, slow down, we're, we're, we're growing, but very slowly. Um, our brain is full size by age six, most, almost 90% of full size by age six, but our body is very small, grows slowly, slowly, slowly. And then we have our growth spurt in puberty, and then we grow fast, and then, and then we're sexually reproductive. Why the delay? Why the slow growth? And the answer seems to be that the amazing human adaptation that makes us cover the world is culture. We are cultural creatures. We learn, and where do we get our culture from? From our elders. Culture has always been transmitted from one generation down to the next with modification. 
Kids need to be enculturated. Most, uh, all traditional societies have initiation rites. The kids are learning, not from their parents. Initiation rites are never guided by the parents. It's always other, if you're a girl, it's gonna be other women in the community. If you're a boy, it's gonna be men in the community. They're socializing, how, to, how does a girl become a woman? How does a boy become a man? Imagine if we cut all that off. How about no more of that? No more intergenerational learning. Let's just have kids hook up to random weirdos on the internet who are selected by algorithm for their extremity. And let's have them watch that for five hours a day. That's their socialization. So slow growth childhood means we have a long period for cultural learning. And the most intense period of cultural learning seems to be about age nine or 10 to about 14, 15. And that's exactly when American kids stop paying attention to the world around them and hook, hook their eyes up to a fire hose of garbage, frankly. I mean, what an incredible argument for your point number two, no social media before 16. I mean, you just made the case. But let's, let's follow up on that a little bit. In the book, you mentioned the high likelihood that when a child becomes addicted to anything at a young age, that it could lead to continued addiction um, and more harmful coping mechanisms or lack thereof later in life. Can you speak to that, please? Yeah, so there's a wonderful book uh, called Dopamine Nation by Anna Lemke, and there are a lot of people writing about dopamine these days. But basically, if your brain has been trained to need more stimulation, you're more vulnerable to all kinds of addiction. You didn't develop executive function as well as you would have. You don't know how to delay gratification as well as you would have, which means you're much more vulnerable to the appeals of any other company that has an addictive product, and that would include gambling and casinos. So you really want your kids in, in their teen years to develop the ability to focus and guide their own behavior. You don't want to hook them up to a company who's, who's pay, literally paying its engineers bonuses if they can keep you on longer. That is literally what Meta did uh, in, the, in the 2010s, bonuses if you can keep them on longer. Um, so yeah, you, I mean, addiction is a huge problem, especially for boys. Boys are getting just easily addicted to all sorts of things, gambling, sports betting, uh, you know, uh, porn, uh, vaping. So uh, we really have to look out for our kids' brains and give them slow dopamine um, is the thing. You strive for something, you work hard for it, and then you get it, and boy, does that feel good. That's slow dopamine. That teaches you that if you work hard, you get the reward. What technology does is it makes everything easy. And for us adults, that's usually good. Like, I want my life to be easy. I want to accomplish my goals quickly and easily. But I would ask, think about your children. Think about it, you have a six or seven year old child. How easy do you want to make that kid's life? If you could, if you could get servants for your child, you have a six year old, would you get her a butler, a maid, a chauffeur, a, you know, a chef? Like, how many servants do you want your six year old to have? Probably zero, I hope, right? Zero, <laughs> zero is the right number, okay? Because you want the kid to learn to clean up her own room and, make, and learn how to cook and learn how to get herself through life. But technology makes everything easy and we should not do that for children. Well, that is um, certainly something that we all need to ponder and that's why we're having these most important conversations. Let's shift to something where Virginia is in the very bullseye yes, yes. and is leading the way. Let's talk about phone-free schools. As you're well aware, um, you heard Secretary Gadara talk about what has uh, happened here in the Commonwealth. And by January of 2025, we will see bell-to-bell -bell phone-free schools Hallelujah. across the Commonwealth of Virginia. I know you are a proponent. Do you feel like our country is at a turning point on this issue? I know it is because we're halfway through it. It's happening at lightning speed. Um, I've been involved in a variety of social change efforts where you have to persuade people and get, have a grassroots movement and it's hard to get people's attention and they don't want to stop to talk. And you know, it, you, it's hard to change people's minds. But on this issue, what's happened is that Everyone who is a parent has seen what's happening. This is not a moral panic spread by the media. Everyone sees it, if not in their own children, in their friends' children, in their sisters' children. And everyone was uncomfortable. And we just didn't quite have a, we didn't know exactly what to do. We didn't have a coordination device. And so what I did in the book was I said, how about if I just offer four clear norms that we can, we can, we can sort of uh, you know, uh, come together around? 
And so, uh, so phone-free schools is, um, is, a, you know, is, is the most powerful and easy one to do. And it's incredible to me how fast it's happened. I never expected it to be like this. Um, in the space of, there was one week where the Surgeon General came out with saying that there should be warning labels on social media. And Los Angeles schools announced the next day that they were going phone free. This was back in June. Um, and, uh, and the governor of California said he was going to try to do it for the state. And the superintendent of schools in New York said he was going to try to do it. And this is, after, this is right after. So those are, those are blue states. But, at, but around the same time, I, I just spoke to the governor of Arkansas, Sarah uh, Huckabee Sanders. Um, she's, been, you know, she's been great on this. Um, so red states, blue states. Uh, uh, you know, parents are ready to go. Teachers despise the phones. Teachers are quitting in droves because they, for years, they can't get through to the students. So, phone-free schools is really a no-brainer. Just as we wouldn't allow kids to bring in their television set and VCR and trumpet and painting kits into class and sit there with their, de you know, it's just insane that we they can do that with a phone. Um, and so I really applaud, again, I just applaud Virginia for doing it. You know, you did it pretty quickly, but thoughtfully. Like that, the, you know, the guidance is just, it's really complete. And I would encourage, you know, everyone, especially if you're a school administrator, the, uh, let's go, wait, the, the website, yeah, they should Google what, VDOE phone free, was that it, cell phone free? If you just Google VDOE, Virginia Department of Education, phone free, they've got a great website with all kinds of resources, because of course there are lots of implementation questions, and schools need to learn from the schools that have gone ahead of them, because there, there are some challenges to implement it. But what I can tell you is this, I have never heard of a school that went phone free and regretted it. I've never, I, and I've put out calls on Twitter, can anyone find a school anywhere that got the phones out and said, wow, that was a mistake? <laughs> Whereas conversely, Conversely, whenever there's a story about a school that went phone free, I know exactly what it's going to say. It's always going to quote someone saying, we hear laughter in the hallways, and we haven't heard that in 10 years. Because when the phones are allowed in school, and especially what a lot of schools do is, oh, we ban phone use during class. You have to put your phone in a phone caddy in the front of the room. So all the kids come in, they put their kid phone in a phone caddy, and then they sit and pay attention to the teacher. Are you kidding me? They're thinking about what's happening on the phone. They're addicted to it, and as soon as you're five minutes from there, they're thinking they're, you know, you know, like Pavlov's dog. I mean, you're ready to go. You gotta get the phone. And then you run, you get the phone, and you only have five minutes between classes, so you gotta scroll, scroll, scroll. So uh, the only way to do this is bell to bell. Um, anyway, what I was saying is nobody ever regrets it. Everybody has the same result, which is the kids are laughing. They're, they're, they're having fun. School becomes more fun. Um, I just heard today someone was telling me the story of a school in which uh, uh, a teacher said, for the first time in 10 years, I had to tell the class to quiet down before class started. <laughs> so yeah, do it. It's, it's amazing. Well, you have to do it. You're ordered to do it. But do it, and it's, it's going to work. Well, I have no doubt that your research and your thoughts are making a difference in this space. My next question was for you to point out the difference between bell to bell versus just banning cell phones uh, during class. You pretty much talked about that, but you, I have heard you speak into the lunch hour mm -hmm. and yeah. the recess yeah. hour. And tell us a little bit about that for the teachers and the administrators that are watching. So beginning in the 80s, we cut way, way back on recess and free time. We thought, we've got to give them more math and science and English, you know, drill, drill, drill. So we kept cut, squeezing down recess. And some schools don't even have recess. It's just, you know, 35, 30 minutes for lunch and, and recess. So um, the kids are desperate for play. They need play. We're, we're, they're pl they were already play deprived um, um, coming into this. Now, what happens when they start bringing their smartphone to class? You know, what you see on the playground is you see a lot of kids are sitting, either they're alone on their phone or they're sitting in groups looking at the phone, but they're not running around. Um, they're not nearly as social. They were play deprived. They had a small block which they could have played, but the phone takes that time. So um, school becomes a play-free zone, which is so sad. Um, so it's vital, vital that it be bell to bell. You must not, if the students say, oh, but can't we have it at lunch? Like, no, no. The point of lunch is to actually eat your food, not just, you know, wolf it down and, and, and get, um, you know, get back on your phone. The point of lunch is the social skills. And this is something that employers comment on all the time. I teach in a business school and I always ask, how, how are your Gen Z employees doing? And they, the employers have so many problems. One of them, they say, is they have such poor social skills. They, they don't look you in the eye, especially the boys. 
So the, so the lunchtime without phones is so good for the kids. Lunchtime with phones is bad for the kids. Well, this bell to bell um, phone free school, I've been giving my husband a hard time and I've been saying, well, every single parent and every single teacher and every single principal in the entire Commonwealth of Virginia is throwing you under the bus. They're saying, it's not my rule, it's the governor's rule. <laughs> Which is so great, he's yeah. not probably well liked by many of the teens in the Commonwealth right no, but, now. But give it a month. That's the thing. But he's the students fine with think that. it's going to be bad. But what the students discover within a couple of weeks is, wow, I can actually talk with other kids. Because kids are so lonely these days. This is one of the most striking things. Levels of loneliness shot up in 2012. Again, there was no change until 2012. And then here's where the boys actually go up a little bit more. They're so lonely because when you're connected to 200 people, you have no time for anyone. And that's what happened to our kids. So phone free from bell to bell, they can actually connect. Wonderful. Let's um, segue to a, a slightly trickier topic. And it was something that Secretary Gadara mentioned earlier. And there are some really uncomfortable real world happenings in and around schools these days. Parents are very concerned about not being able to reach stu students during a school em emergency. And despite Virginia's best in class protocols and um, amazing uh, communication tools, enhanced presence of resource officers, how should parents, how should we think about this issue? Yeah. Yeah, and I'm glad you, you asked that because this, this is the most common objection. And I completely understand it. You know, I, as I said, my, my kids go to New York City public schools. And if there was, if there was a shooting incident or some, something like that, I would want to know that they're okay. I would want to talk to them. I'd want to hear them. But we have to do what is best for the kids, not what's best for our feelings in the moment. And the school security experts all say the same thing. When there's an emergency, the last thing you want is every kid pulling out their phone and saying, bye, mom, I love you. What you want is the kids to do what they drilled to do. There are reasons why we have security protocols in place. And so the security experts say, keep quiet, follow directions. The teacher has a phone. Well, the teachers will always have phones. Um, so it, it, there's, it's a natural parental response to want to call instantly, in part because we've been connected to our kids from the, you know, from the moment we cut the umbilical cord, we stay connected to them. Um, and we, we have to learn to let go and trust that in the school, they care about the kids and they're doing what's best for the kids. So it's hard for us, but we have to do what's best for the kids. Fascinating, thank you so much. Okay, we're gonna move to the last one now, believe it or not. And this really falls into that category of unsupervised play, which I would argue is not specific to youth, we as adults need to do more of it too. But you spend a disproportionate amount of this book um, really talking about free play. And you use the word discovery a lot. I loved that word discovery. Um, at one point, um, you compare fragile children to fragile trees. I loved that, that was very helpful for me to visualize. Can you tell us that story because I'd love other people to share in that. And can you challenge us? Because I'm gonna raise my hand as being one of those overprotective mothers. And we're protecting out of love. But tell us how we can maybe be a little less protective of our kids. So the key concept here is a word called anti-fragility or anti-fragile. Some things are fragile. You wouldn't let your kids play with a, a wine glass because if they play with it, it'll break. Nothing good happens. So we give them sippy cups, which are plastic, which is resilient. But if they drop a sippy cup, it doesn't get better. It just doesn't break. And there are certain systems, biological systems mostly, that actually get better when you drop them. That, that, so the immune system is the classic example. If you protect your kid's immune system, I don't want any bacteria or dirt or germs to get to my kid's immune system. Then the immune system can't develop. Our evolution requires kids to play in the dirt, sample what's around, the immune system tunes up, so, that, so the immune system is anti-fragile. Our bones and muscles are anti-fragile. The story about trees is a, is a funny one. There was a, older people remember, there was a thing called the biosphere experiment in the 1990s where they tried to have an enclosed environment that humans could live in and use all the same oxygen and water because someday we'll have to do that on Mars. So they planted it and they planted the trees, the trees in the tropical rainforest part, they grew quickly, but then they fell over for no reason. And it turns out that the designers forgot to include wind 
because when a tree grows, the wind pushes it and that pulls on the roots, which tells the roots you gotta grow more over here to anchor it. And it compresses the wood and that tells the wood you gotta adopt a form that's more resilient, it's tougher to compression. And if you take it easy on the tree, then it doesn't get strong. And if you take it easy on your child, if there are never any challenges, if they're never excluded, if they never take risks, if they're never afraid, they don't learn how to manage their own life in a world that has some risk. So what we need to do is to realize our kids need love. All kids need a secure base. All kids need an adult that they know they can go to, that they can trust. They need a secure base. But the point of the base is not to keep them safe for 18 years and send them off to college. Please don't send your kid to me at NYU if you did that. <laughs> the point of the base is that the kid has a safe place to come back to when they go on their off-base excursions. That's why we have this long childhood. That's why the, you know, baby kittens and dogs, they don't just play right by the mother, they explore, they climb up trees, they do all sorts of things, gradually going further and further away. And that's what you want. It's painful, perhaps, but that's, you know, being a parent means ultimately letting go. So, you know, so once you realize that kids are anti-fragile, that they need to go out and sometimes bite off more than they can chew, sometimes climb too high on a tree, sometimes get afraid, sometimes get lost, and discover that they can actually ask for help and get back. And so it's, it's that kind of experience. If we can give them more of that, we speed their development, we increase their confidence, and we cut their anxiety and depression. And the best possible program to do that, you can do this at home or better yet, do it in schools, is called the Let Grow Experience. So uh, here in the front row, we have Lenore Skenazy, my friend who wrote the book, Free Range Kids. Uh, and thank God my wife and I met her in New York City and read her book and we, it helped us to let go with our kids, let them walk to school earlier, send them out to the grocery store when they were eight or nine, when we were, you know, and, and at first we followed them, like we got behind them and tracked them and oh, okay, she's okay. And, you know, um, so Lenora and I, I, I encourage Lenora to really uh, increase her, her, her effectiveness in the world. So we, we created a nonprofit organization called Let Grow, go to letgrow.org. And the, the main, the, our most powerful program, it's really ideal for schools, is called the Let Grow Experience. And all it is, is the kid go, you, it costs zero dollars, costs nothing whatsoever. Um, well, okay, a mimeo, you know, one, one piece of paper per kid. You take it, the kid takes it home, and the instructions are, find something, so talk to your parents, and find something that you can do with your parent that you've never done before, with your parents' permission, but without your parents. And, and there's some suggestions. Maybe it's walk the dog. If you've never walked the dog by yourself, I, I, you know, mom, I think I could do that. Um, or maybe it's go to the uh, corner store and get a quart of milk or make my own breakfast or make breakfast for the family, whatever. You come up with something and then the parents agree and then parents sit back and then the kid does it. Now think what happens. Suppose, suppose you have a school district. Suppose you have this school district right here. Suppose you do this in all, for all the third graders. So all the third grades in this whole district, let's say, they do the Lecro experience. What happens? Um, parents would never let their eight-year-old cross the street unsupervised. They'd never let their eight-year-olds go to a store four blocks away unsupervised. Well, now it's a homework assignment, and everyone's doing it. And before you know it, people see eight-year-olds doing things, and the eight-year-olds feel useful. And when they come back, it's, it's always the same thing. They're jumping up and down. They're so excited uh, because they've done something. And that's what childhood should be about. So the Let Grow experience is incredibly powerful. Um, the kids love it, and it, it doesn't just have anti-anxiety effects on the kids. The more important effect, I think, is ultimately on the parents, because we're all so anxious when we let our kids out of our sight the first time. And what I found, what my wife and I found, is then this, the first day we let our son walk to school alone, we were really nervous. I mean, we wanted to run after him and make sure that he could cross the street. But he's so good at crossing streets and riding subways, and he, you know, he understands it all. Um, but by the third day, we weren't anxious anymore. And that's just straight you know, behaviorist conditioning. We, the way to get over anxiety is to experience it. And then nothing bad happens, and the next day it'll be less. So our parents raised us with a lot less anxiety, and we had fun, and we had adventures. We have so much anxiety, we're not letting our kids grow. That's why it's called Let Grow. Let Grow. That's amazing. You also mentioned, tell us your favorite piece of equipment on a playground. Uh, <laughs> it's definitely the, it's called the, either the playground spinner or a, it's the thing where, you know, it's like this heavy metal thing with like the bars and you have to push it. And if you get four kids, you can really push it. You run and run and then you jump onto it. 
And for a lot of us, it was our first real experience of centrifugal force. Like we'd spun around, you know, we got dizzy, but this is, it's like, a phys, it's like a physics education. You begin to understand forces and you get dizzy. And, but the thing is you have to cooperate. And the more kids you have, the faster it goes and the more exciting it is. And it's a little bit risky. Raise your hand if you ever played on one of these playground spinners, okay? Raise your hand, just those of you, raise your hand. Raise your hand if you ever got hurt on them. You ever got thrown off? Yeah, okay, <laughs> right? That was just part, so that's important. This is what I really wanna get across. Um, as one, as one uh, camp administrator once said to me, we want to see bruises, not scars. So if you send your kids to a camp where nobody gets bruised, don't send them to that camp. You want to take, so small risks are good for your kids, okay? The one other thing I want to follow up on here too. Notice I'm free forming now. I'm sorry. Um, you mentioned that play and slow growth activities are inconsistent with organized activities at which a parent is engaged and or um, very active. I think we all have uh, really um, focused on sports and organized after school activities. That could be a dance class, that could be a brownie group, that could be whatever. But more often than not, as parents, we do engage, right. whether you're the coach, whether it's whatever. Why does that not allow for the level of emotional and physical growth that this let grow program that this free range um, uh, concept does. So if you look around the world at traditional societies, you'll very rarely see an adult playing with a child. The kids are off playing in different age groups, uh, different, I'm sorry, multi-age, like you know, older kids, younger kids, they're all off playing. And, and in that way, the older kids are actually learning to take care of the younger kids. The younger kids are looking up to the older kids. They wanna copy them. If they get hurt, they don't wanna cry and be a baby. They wanna to look tough and come back to the play. So, so much learning happens when you have mixed age play without adults. The most nutritious part is the conflicts. Uh, Jean Piaget, the great developmental psychologist, studied this, like when boys playing marbles, and he was especially interested in the disputes because when one kid says, no, you, che you cheated, that, no, you're out of bounds. Okay, now they have to adjudicate it. And so, you know, and so all the boys come together and, they, and they, they, they argue their case and everyone wants the play to continue. So nobody's gonna just storm off and go home, but they learn those skills of negotiation, of making your case, um, of sometimes the decision goes against you and you have to just, just go with it. So they learn really valuable skills for democratic society in free play without adult supervision. What happens on a video game? Uh, on a video game, there's no possibility of a conflict. There's never a dispute, there can't be, because the platform adjudicates everything. So the boys get a lot of excitement in play, but they don't get the nutritious skills. So a video game is really like junk food. It's sure, it's got some calories, it's fun, but it doesn't really, it doesn't do that, that sort of moral development. What happens when you're doing team sports with a bunch of coaches and adults screaming orders and taking care of all the dispute resolution? It's a lot better than sitting home playing video games. At least it's teamwork on a field. So I'm, I'm not saying team sports is bad in any way. Um, team sports is very good, but it's just, it's just not nearly as nutritious or not nearly as good developmentally as, you know, if you're, instead of being on a soccer team with coaches, if your kids have a regular Saturday pickup soccer game in the neighborhood, that's the best possible thing. It's much better than team sports with a coach. And if, and if they are on team sports with a coach, at least to the degree that the coaches can step back and let the kids handle more things, that would be better. Very inconsistent with the way things are done right now. <laughs> Just saying. Um, okay, you talk about overprotection. This is, we're, we're coming to a close here. You talk about overprotection in the real world, what we're just talking about, and underprotection in the digi digital world. What are we supposed to do about that as parents who may or may not be adept at navigating the digital world like our children are? Yeah, so, um, you know, as I said, in the 90s, we got really scared of the real world. Uh, we thought there would be kidnappers and criminals. Now, of course, the crime rate was actually plummeting in the 90s. The crime rate now is down to where it was in the 19, early 1960s. So the world's gotten safer and safer. We didn't feel that. 
So we pulled our kids in. We don't let them go outside. But at the same time, in the 90s, the internet's coming in. And at first, the internet was amazing. And the millennials grew up on it. And they had fun with it. And they started companies. And they had inventions. They learned to program. Um, so the early internet was actually pretty good. And we thought, well, this is just what childhood is. They're not out there playing, but they're playing in cyberspace. Like, wow, isn't that exciting? And at first, it wasn't terribly toxic. Uh, and so, it cre so all the way through even 2012, when you get the Arab Spring, we're all thinking like, oh, the internet and social media, is, it's going to tear down dictatorships. It's the best thing for democracy. Our kids are growing up on this. It's going to be amazing, we thought. And it wasn't. Um, as, as we went through, between 2010 and 2015, a lot changes, it gets much more toxic. Facebook develops its business model. Uh, wait, one of you was saying, I just was in the wind, one of you was talking about early Facebook. We, oh, you know, you just see photos. Like There was no news feed, but Facebook develops a business model using algorithms to feed you content that it's selected to keep you on. That's when it gets really toxic and bad for kids. And that's when mental health plummets. So um, we need to, as we've been just talking about, we must stop overprotecting our kids in the real world. They have to grow up. Not, they can't grow up on base. They have to grow up off base. We have to let them out. Um, and at the same time, we have to protect them more in the online world. Now, once you give your kid a phone or access to the internet all the time, you're going to enter the phase that almost all parents are in, which is that family life is an eternal struggle over, over screen time. And your kids are better at it than you. So I don't really, uh, there's very few people who are really doing this well. It's really hard. Uh, people in Silicon Valley, either they have problems too, or they just ban it. In Silicon Valley, a lot of them don't let their kids use this stuff, and they send their kids to Waldorf schools that have no technology at all because paper and pencil is best. So the people who make the stuff know how bad it is for kids. We should probably pay some attention to that. Anyway, my point is, if you're going to try to regulate what they're doing online, you know, good luck. That's really hard. That's why I just say over and over again, just delay it. Just delay um, let's, let's have a norm that we just don't give our kids a smartphone before high school. You can give them a flip phone, especially in middle school, um, uh, and do not let them on social media until 16. Um, so again, that's, why, that's the point of the four norms. It's hard if you're the only parent who follows these norms, then your kid is isolated. My daughter really wants Snapchat. She's the only one who doesn't have it. She's in 10th grade now, and I've said no. Um, but what we hear over and over again is, I, and I meet so many young people who say, uh, you know, my parents didn't let me have a phone and I resented it at the time, but man, am I glad they did. You'll never find a, a, a person in their 20s who say, man, I wish my parents had let me have a smartphone and social media younger. You don't find that. You find a lot, and surveys show this, a lot who say, I wish they didn't give it to me so young. So two more questions, and then we're going to go into conversation. Um, Gen Z, let's face it now, has come along. A lot of the parents here actually have children that are a little bit younger. For, and this is purely selfish because Glenn and I are parents to four Gen Zers, um, talk to families here and those online about what we should do now to support Gen Z in their journey, recognizing that they're really hurting. So, uh, um, so a great thing about Gen Z is that they're not in denial at all. They're not defensive about this. They know about the problems. They see that social media is causing their problems. They know that, they have that their generation has mental health problems. And so they, they really want mentorship. They want challenges. Um, and even if they don't know that they want that, if you put it to them that way, so if you're supervising, this is what I tell people in, in the corporate world, because every, everyone's having difficulty bringing their Gen Z employees on. Um, and I say, have them read, have them read about anti-fragility. If you go to thecoddling.com, chapter one of that book was a, what I just told you about anti-fragility. If, if, you know, just have them read that and they get it, they get it right away. And then say, um, you know, I, um, um, I can either give you feedback, I can either, you know, be very careful and gentle and try not to hurt your feelings, or I can tell you everything you're doing wrong because I want you to grow. I want you to be excellent at this job. And, and I, I test this with my students. They'll all, they'll all take the latter. So my point is, um, they've been play deprived. They've been independence deprived. They've been experience deprived. Uh, but it's not too late to make up for it in your late teens and early 20s. By 25, the brain is more sort of locked down. It's sort of done with myelinization in the, in the prefrontal cortex. But my, I teach a course at NYU. For not, it's all freshmen and sophomores. 
Um, and they're all doing this all day long. And they, they know it's bad for them. And it's hard to stop. But they do it together. We get, we, you know, we, they make amazing progress. You can make amazing progress if you change your habits. So what I would say to all the older Gen Z folks and all the parents of older Gen Z um, is if you change your habits, you'll change your consciousness. Uh, and you'll be able to develop focus. Um, one of the most important things I do with my students is we turn off almost all notifications. Um, and I, I encourage them to, when they're walking through a beautiful park, to not be multitasking, to just notice how beautiful the world is. A lot of them haven't noticed. Uh, and so there's a lot you can do in your late teens, early 20s, but you have to do it very deliberately and it's gonna be a lot easier if you do it with a group. If you can find a group of friends, or if you do it in a company. Um, you know, uh, so, um, so it's, yeah, it's hard to do alone, just because these things are so addictive, and everyone else is doing this stuff, and you're gonna be pressured to do what everyone else is doing. Um, Great. So what gives you hope? What gives me hope is that things are changing so fast, uh, it's that, the parents all see it and they're signing up like, yes, where, you know, what can I do? The teachers all see it and they're like, hallelujah, we've hated this for 10 years. The principals <laughs> are all like, it's been chaos and drama. Let's get rid of the phones right now. Um, it's happening around the world. Um, Australia just announced they're gonna try to set the age limit at 16. They're gonna try to do age verification and enforce a 16 year, uh, 16 age limit for social media. The UK is acting. Um, so. Sometimes, very rarely, but sometimes we can face one of the largest problems we face. And I would put this up, I would put this at, well, I don't wanna, I shouldn't say specific issues that people care about, but I think this certainly is one of the top two or three, and I think the top issue we face, because we're talking about, it's not just mental illness. It's a decline in education. Education around the world has been dropping since 2012 because everyone's doing this all day long. Um, um, it's, a, it's, it's a vast destruction of human potential and human capital. Um, and so this is a gigantic problem. But it's incredible to me how much change there has been in the last few months. We're, we are at the tipping point. Um, uh, and the biggest things that can happen is for an entire state to go phone free. Education policy in this country is all state and local. Federal government has nothing to do with it, thank God, I guess, because if it was up to them, not much would get done. Um, but when a state like Virginia goes phone free, fully, bell to bell, that shows that it's possible. That shows that when we come together, um, we can make big change. And at a time when our country is so divided, my, you know, my other book was gonna be about all these terrible problems we're having in American democracy. Uh, we have different sets of facts. We live in different worlds. Even still, everyone sees the problem. And on this issue, my team and I, we were just in, uh, at Congress. We, we spent the day talking with, uh, with representatives about COSA, the Kids Online Safety Act. And it's the most remarkable thing. Everybody, because almost all the politicians are parents, everybody has seen it. And this is one of the few issues that left and right, red and blue, we're all united on. So if we can't do this, then we can't do anything. And so when, we see, when I see states like Virginia acting, I think maybe we can do this. Maybe we can do something. I think we are doing this. So, we are. there you go. Um, I, I cannot thank you enough for your time. Uh, more than anything, I wanna thank you for seeking culture change. Uh, it's based on data. We love data here. You know, I don't think anything is random and we're sitting in Old Bridge Elementary, right? So I looked up the definition of bridge today, and a bridge is a structure that carries a road or a path over an obstacle. And so tonight, I think potentially, we are creating a new bridge that will help us recapture childhood in the Commonwealth of Virginia and the United States of America. We are so deeply grateful to you and your team. We cannot thank you enough. We are going to watch you closely to see what you come up with next. And I really do hope that this evening has been hugely encouraging. It certainly has been for me. I am going to welcome the principal of Old Bridge up, please. Yes. Principal Francisco. Thank you to our First Lady, Suzanne Yunkin and Dr. Haight for their engaging discussion.
I'm confident that you both have provided our attendees with valuable insights to ponder and discuss during the facilitated portion of the event. For the facilitated portion of tonight's event, we kindly ask our attendees to exit through the back and take a seat at one of the designated circles. Facilitators will initiate conversation and guide the discussions with individual groups. Please use this time to engage in honest and meaningful dialogue with fellow community members as every voice matters. But before we begin that portion, Dr. Latif would like to come up and say a few remarks. Please welcome Dr. Latif. Thank you. Thank you. Let's thank again the First Lady and Dr. Haidt for coming tonight. I want to thank Secretary Gadara and Superintendent Coons for their support for our schools in the Commonwealth and for the immense success we're seeing because of their good work. Thank you to the First Lady for her work, not only on this, but on mental health and addiction. It is incredible. And to Dr. Haid, who provides not just outlining the problems, but outlining a solution. And, and I'll just end with, you know, we did a pilot in middle school two years ago on phone free. Engagement went up, performance went up, but one of the things we didn't expect until after we read his book, which came out later, was cyberbullying and harassment went down dramatically. And so we want to thank you, and we look forward to the facilitated sessions this evening. Thank, thank you very thank much. Thank you all so much. <laughs>